Hello, everybody. This is Lowell Thomas, and I intend to ask one or two questions, which you, too, have probably asked, and then I intend to answer them. America, for 300 years, has been the land of promise for the rest of the world, the land of new frontiers, new opportunities for all. Today, the job of building this nation geographically is completed. There are no new frontiers within our borders. So, here are my questions and yours. To what new horizons can we look now? Where are tomorrow's opportunities? What's ahead in America for you, for your children? It is not a difficult assignment to answer these questions. The frontiers of the future are not on any map. They are in the minds of men and in the test tubes and laboratories of the great industries we have built up here in America. But now, what's ahead of us? Many of us have had our doubts. There are those who say today that opportunities have ceased to exist. Things are finished. We have everything and not enough. There can be no more progress. Almost 100 years ago, in the old patent office in Washington, the commissioner of patents was just as pessimistic as anyone you have ever heard. The advancement of our arts from year to year taxes our credulity and seems to presage the arrival of that period when human improvements must end. In other words, in 1844, the commissioner was about ready to shut up the patent office and go home, believing that everything had been invented. That progress in America had already come to an end. He didn't know that within two years he would be signing a patent on a method of vulcanizing rubber from which there was destined to spring up hundreds of new industries and jobs by the thousands that were made possible through this one idea. No, the pessimists of that day never dreamed of the marvels that would soon follow their predictions. They overlooked one all-important fact that we should know so well. That is, as long as there is a problem to be solved or a desire to be met, American ingenuity will not rest. Today, industry in this country is spending over $200 million a year to improve old products and develop new products, which mean new industries, new jobs. They are working constantly to solve problems and find ways to give us what we want, better things for less money. In any one of thousands of test tubes of today, there may be a million job opportunities for tomorrow. Fifteen years after Commissioner Ellsworth's gloomy predictions, Edwin Drake surprised skeptics by pumping petroleum out of the hills of Pennsylvania. For years, the oil men cursed gasoline. It was a troublesome byproduct, and they dumped millions of gallons of it into the rivers and streams. Then, science discovered that gasoline was liquid horsepower. You know what has happened since. Oil and gasoline we demand today furnishes employment to millions of people. And these are only two products obtained from crude petroleum, which was industrially worthless until American technicians changed a barrel of oil into an Aladdin's lamp, which can produce an endless variety of valuable products. Look at just a few things created by scientific research in laboratories operated by the oil companies of America byproducts of petroleum from which have sprung up entirely new industries. Face cream for the ladies. Special tasteless waxes for certain kinds of candies. Wax for sealing letters. Soap. Fertilizers for the farmers. Coke. Ink. Streets and highways. And on this frontier, opportunities have hardly been touched. But let's get out of the oil business and find out what's going on in other fields. I've been around a lot and talked with some of these research men, and they won't make predictions because they deal only in facts. But they're on their way to new ideas, new things that will astonish us when they are announced. For instance, one research man said recently, there is one result that has been going on for a long time to find out why we can see through glass. You say it's transparent, but that's merely an adjective, not a reason. 
Engineers think they know what friction is, but actually they can't yet tell you what it is any more than they can tell you what electricity is. In one big laboratory, they're trying to find out what makes grass green. And the answer to that question may keep us industrially busy for years. With automobile engines, we've just really started. The indication is that someday they will give us 300 miles to the gallon. And as for electric lights, well, so many improvements will come that'll make today's lighting look like the tallow candle age. We have discovered how to manufacture rubber from coal, limestone, salt, and water. From a product of cotton, we are spinning a filament finer than that of the silkworm. Out of air, water, and coal, we produce a fertilizer for which Americans formerly had to travel thousands of miles. In coal, we have found the colors of the rainbow and the perfumes of nature's sweetest flowers. Chemistry is creating new and more comfortable homes, giving you finer and yet vastly cheaper motor cars, better clothes, purer food, and sounder health. And what these laboratories promise in the way of a market for the farmer staggers the imagination. Today, just one great chemical company is the farmer's biggest single customer. It buys annually 16,500,000 pounds of cotton, the yield from 100,000 acres. 700,000 pounds of cottonseed oil, 36 million pounds of cotton linters, 36 million bushels of corn, 38 of wood pulp, 40 million gallons of molasses, 6,500,000 pounds of turpentine and rosin, and 23 million pounds of vegetable oils. These purchases in the aggregate represent the yield of over 4 million acres of farmlands, which would more than cover the whole state of New Jersey. And the chemical age is just dawning. Already, industry is making airplane propellers with sour milk as an ingredient. Roads from cotton and artificial leather from the same material. The time may come when the American farmer will grow a crop of automobile engines or rocking chairs. These few things, my friends, are only a hint of what American industry holds in the future. And remember, every time one of these infant industries clicks with the public, gives you what you want, presto, a new industry is created with new jobs and new payrolls. Here are just a few lusty infants. Unbreakable optical lenses for your glasses. Television. Gasoline from sea sand. Rubies from peach pits. Sponges from wood and cotton. Artificial wool from cheese, but uh, not with the holes. Vinegar from coke and limestone. Waste gases from the factory converted into antifreeze for your car. Sheep have been raised on chemicals from the laboratory. Plants grown without soil. From cotton, sour milk, formaldehyde, and carbolic acid all scrambled together in the laboratory come noiseless gears, costume jewelry, fountain pens, billiard balls, telephone parts, and many other plastics of beauty and utility. So maybe the moon is made of green cheese. And even if it isn't, the explorers of the research laboratories could probably find a way to do it. One thing is certain. It is these research activities sponsored by American industry that have brought us this far and will continue to create further progress for us. And the industrial scientists and engineers are the pioneers of present day America the creators of progress, of new industries and new jobs. Train your sights on the laboratories of American industry to see what's ahead. It's a bewildering future, all right, not because there are no new frontiers, but because there are so many. So, on with progress. You're watching Sleep Corps, media for insomnia.
As the opening date of the Brussels World's Fair nears, the elaborate pavilions of the 48 nations taking part are rushed to completion. America's building, the world's largest freestanding circular structure, will be an architectural landmark. Scores of international and commercial groups are also taking part in the rivalry for the attention of the 40 million visitors expected. One of the commercial exhibits is a vast diorama of the Belgian countryside, which will model a prophecy of progress in transportation. Under a complex electronic control system, a diorama will show the transformation from today into the world of the future. The Atomium, fitting symbol for the first World's Fair of the Atomic Age. One of the proposed cable channels will be devoted exclusively to interactive programs that are designed to involve the viewer. UTV. It's a whole new view for cable with a whole new concept in programming. We call it Involving. It is really a quite wonderful new world that is developing out there. Uh, but as wonderful as it, as it is, it's also frightening. What frightens some people about two-way television is the possible invasion of our privacy. Think of it. Viewers will play along, phone or mail in, learn how to or buy what they see, and will document their response. I believe that there is a legitimate concern on privacy in view of the new technologies like cable. Uh, the cable operator will know a great deal about that household, what it, what it watches, uh, uh, products it's interested in, because it's going to turn more and more to transactions. And I think that uh, the consumer should be protected here. Those transactions will include shopping at home, such as this experimental American Express television catalog. A rugged, lightweight AMF moped that will get you as far as 170 miles on a gallon of gas. They've been using them in Europe for years. There's just one simple control plus two brake levers. And if you turn off the 49cc motor, it pedals as easily as a bicycle. $349. I believe that there should be a, re a requirement put on the cable operator by the government that he inform the public of what information will be collected, how it will be used, to whom will it be turned over. I think that the public should have access to what records are kept on, on them by the cable operator, should have the ability to correct those records, and finally I think there should be an expectation of confidentiality. Now all these were principles that were laid down in privacy legislation by the Carter administration, it would be applicable to medical records, to certain credit records, uh, to insurance records. I believe the same principles that I have enunciated should be applicable here in the cable field, and that should come by legislation. Holding a somewhat different view on the need for legislation is Mark Fowler, chairman of the Federal Communication Commission. He's been leading an effort to remove regulations from the television industry. The countervailing consideration that's involved here is if too many strictures are imposed in the name of privacy, it should be so onerous as to thwart or discourage the development of these new technologies that could serve people. And that's the balance. And it's a very difficult problem. The answer is there are no clear answers. But are we concerned? Absolutely. And would we act? if uh, the appropriate day and time came that it became a real issue. It's not yet. I think this agency or Congress would act. What I want you to do is, if you would like a copy of the recipe that Scott's about to do for us, you need to touch button number one on your cube console, and you'll see the flashing touch now sign come up. It will just come up and stay there. It won't flash on and off. And I must remind you that you'll no longer be anonymous. What you're allowing us to do, basically, is to draw your name out of the computer We'll make a mailing list, and we'll send you a copy of the recipe right to your doorstep. How about that? Having your name drawn out of a computer to receive a recipe may not seem like an invasion of your privacy, but that same computer, if abused, could track your votes on other issues as well. I'd like to ask uh, people a very basic question, and that is, what effect do you think Reaganomics will have on the economy? Do you think it will, number one, greatly help? Number two, somewhat help? Number three, make no difference? Number four, somewhat hurt. 
Number five, greatly hurt. Personal privacy is not the only issue that concerns observers of the new television technologies. In what ways will electronic voting change our lives? There's something very attractive about instant polling. It sounds like you can get public opinion instantly. The real danger of that, where politics is concerned, the conduct of government, is that a congressman who may have done, who may have studied an issue quite thoroughly, uh, may find that he's undermined by an instant poll taken in his community, where people are not as informed on the issues as he, uh, and that their vote in this instant plebiscite uh, uh, is not the vote he would have cast. And then he's put in the position of having to cast the vote uh, that his constituency um, would have him cast or wishes cast. That's one danger of it. The bigger danger of it is that it's really a gimmick. It's a showbiz gimmick, the way it's used and the way probably it will be used. We don't know how big the sample is in those instant polls, nor do we know who it is that's voting. Uh, my experience uh, when I visited the cube system in Columbus, and I went to a number of homes and saw the people, I found that it was the young people, three children, who loved to hit that button for the vote. On one of the programs they had, there was a, a thing as to whether or not you'd be willing to go and review a movie for Cube. And uh, I didn't know it. My son punched in that we would love to go and review a movie. And the next thing I knew, I had a phone call from Cube asking me if I would be willing to come. So when I checked around and found out that Will had done it, it turned out it was an R-rated movie. So he couldn't go. So my husband and I went and picked up the tickets and went and saw the movie. And uh, a couple days later, I got a phone call from Cube informing me that the reviewing and the questioning on the film would be done on live television, which was a real thrill, because that meant I had, my husband wouldn't do that. So I had to go down to Cube and sit there and review the movie. And uh, so I said, I don't know how many other things he's punched in on for us, but that was the one that involved me. And I wasn't real excited about this part, but it was fun. It ended up being a lot of fun doing that. Uh, let me tell you a story of my own experience. In channels, we had an article on the dangers of um, the invasion of privacy by two-way cable. And I was called one day by the cable news network uh, to talk about my magazine. And they said, uh, Mr. Brown, in Channels Magazine, you have an article saying that uh, people ought to be frightened about two-way cable because of the invasion of privacy aspect. And I said, yes, we have such an article. And they said, okay, we're gonna take a poll of the people in Columbus now on our cube system and see how they feel about that. And so they took the poll and about 70% of the people, in a minute you get the answer, and about 70% of the people said, no, they weren't about worried at all about the invasion of privacy. And 30% said they more or less were worried about it. So they said, see, people, in, uh, people who have two-way cable aren't worried about this and, uh, uh, and you're raising a, a bomb issue. Um, the fact is, we don't know how many people were out there voting in that uh, poll in the first place. Worse than that, we don't know whether they're giving us the correct answer. We have to take it on faith. What if 70% of the people said, yes, they were worried about the invasion of privacy? Uh, and they simply reported the answer they wanted to report. And that's one of the real dangers of, uh, of that kind of polling, and um, it's one that makes me very nervous. Will the home of the future be invaded by two-way television? Will instant plebiscites turn democracy into electronic mob rule? Will the cultural arms of big business reach deep into the lives of unknowing consumers? Or will the conveniences of the electronic cottage outweigh any disadvantage? My great dream and fantasy is being able to punch in and have my groceries automatically ordered for me. I detest going to the grocery store. And it seems to me like we already have the technology to be able to, through the phone lines and through the cable lines, have the items brought up on the screen and then order it and have it prepared and ready for me to pick up. It's even possible that you have it automatically deducted from your checking account or your master charge or visa. I'd like to see um, home banking is one of the very prime things that's becoming up, coming up, and also 
home shopping and possibly down the road um, energy management. I would like to use the TV in the future for shopping, to do my son, some of my son's shopping for convenience because it's hard to take him shopping and it saves a lot of time which seems very important to me right now and um, I would like to use it for banking because that seems like a trip you're making constantly that I would like to do without and it would be nice to have it for um, temperature control in the house. How much will these services cost? While systems vary from town to town, basic cable service typically costs about $9 per month. Adding interactive two-way service, three more dollars. A subscription movie channel, $9. A premium channel like one of the new cultural arts channels, $12. A special one-time only event like a heavyweight boxing match, $10. Home security, $17. And if your son or daughter does their homework on the cable's computer system, that costs $5 an hour, so let's say $15 a So it is not unlikely that some people might find themselves paying $75 a month for the services they'll receive over the cable wire. Cable is likely to be a bigger business than telephone. Um, when telephone came into people's homes, uh, it had a little nickel coin box and people put in 25 cents a week. Uh, today people pay, uh, they call all over the world and call all over the country and, and uh, pay $100, $150 a month and don't think much about uh, that it's part of living. And I think cable is going to uh, come to be that way with us too. There's a perception that cable television may in fact eliminate free television or broadcast television uh, and substitute a pay system. And that is not the case. Uh, I, I'd like to point out simply that uh, free television is obviously not free, it's supported by advertising which is passed on in the cost of everything we buy as a form of tax, which everyone pays. And uh, that will continue. There is no threat whatsoever to the continuance of that uh, service. Cable television and of course the interactive and advanced services that uh, we're discussing are supplementary they're advanced, uh, and those who wish to have them will have that option. It's simply an option. Those who wish to have the advanced services of cable TV will receive many benefits and conveniences in their lives. But what of those who cannot afford the wealth of services offered by the new TV technologies? There's much to be said for the revolution in people paying for television and television services. The downside of that is that people who can't afford to pay are going to be deprived. And this is going to divide the country, probably, into information haves and information have not. A society based uh, on voting with dollars, uh, food, automobiles, uh, and any other goods or services I can think of are provided on the basis of uh, payment and distributed uh, more to those who wish to pay and less to those who do not wish to pay or cannot pay. Uh, and I think this uh, cable television uh, service is no different from any other uh, commodity in our economy. Uh, it costs money and someone has to pay for it. I think it's possible that we may have to go to a system of cable stamps or information stamps, just as we do food stamps. I know that sounds absurd, but uh, the idea has been raised, uh, and it seems to make some sense. Because a lot of these new media, uh, two-way cable and, and all this, are going to be tied into large computer banks and information uh, centers. And, um, obviously, there's going to be an inequity in the society. Information has always been power. It's been social power, and it's been economic power. And this is truer today than it ever was. And what we have now is the possibility through these delivery systems which pay, which ask you to pay for information, the prospect of a new stratification system, or let's say the exaggeration of an old stratification system in the United States, where you have the information poor and the information rich. You get the information not only if you have the money to pay for it, 
but if you have the background to know that it is information that you ought to have. Now we're talking about an additional 5%. Putting their cost drop. Bear in mind that when you have a, a cable system that has 100 channels on it, that really does sound like you have 100 different voices coming at you, and you can select from a panoply of 100 different sources. But in fact, they're like times of a rake. They all meet at a handle, one handle. The guy who owns the cable system controls those 100 channels. And he can control what goes out over those 100 channels. And if there are 200 different program services up there on the satellite, the guy who holds the rake can pick of those 200 the 100 that most agree with his political philosophy, for example. So this is a real concern. There's a great chance, a terrible chance, that the whole that, that we are drifting towards a kind of oligarchy of um, away from democracy to an oligarchy controlled by large corporations. The federal government has been concerned about the control of broadcasting since it passed the Federal Communications Act in 1927. The act states that the airwaves, which are a scarce resource, belong to the people and that broadcasters will be licensed to operate in the public interest as a public trustee. Now that we can receive television by wire, satellite, cassette, and disc, and not just the public airwaves, a controversy has arisen over whether television should continue to be regulated by government or if it should be deregulated and left to the fluctuations of the open marketplace. The role and purpose uh, of regulating the television industry has been to ensure that it does operate in the public interest. Uh, there is a need to license television because otherwise there would be chaos if everybody tried to get on channel 4 or 2. The government decided in 1927 and 34 upon a scheme of licensing that is public trustee. That you're licensed for a short term to operate in the public interest. And so the regulation has been to, to try to ensure that public interest operation. Well, when we talk about unregulating, we talk about, as the president has, removing the government from interfering with the people's lives and commerce to the maximum extent possible. And I believe that. I've said that I'm a Reagan supporter. I'm not a closet Reaganite. I'm sitting on the front steps. I think we're really pursuing lunatic policies in this country where these new media are concerned. Uh, of course, I understand that uh, there is deregulation fever in Washington and that there is much, much, there's much to be said for getting government off the back of business and all that sort of thing. But deregulating ra railroads and the trucking industries and the airlines is a lot different from deregulating broadcast media. There are, there are basically uh, two points to be made. One, on a First Amendment basis, I believe it is wrong for the government to be involved in content regulation of broadcasters. And two, I believe that the marketplace is a better mechanism for assuring that the kinds of programming that the people would like to see and hear are indeed the kinds of programming that they receive from broadcasters. I think that uh, in view of the fact that the regulation has been largely ineffectual, has been a charade, that it is time to move off that system. However, it, the one place where I disagree with Chairman Fowler and others who simply turn to the marketplace, is that the marketplace won't supply everything. I think you can see that if you look at radio. There are over 8,000 commercial radio stations, so you have now an abundance of radio. But if you depended upon those 8,000 radio stations for your entire public service, you would find that it was deficient. There's no regulation that has been put in by, gov by government and has not been put in because some industry group wanted it in. The existing regulations protected the existing interests. Deregulation means that a new set of interests will be protected by some mechanism that is yet to be decided. In this decade, there will be basic changes made as to the public trustee nature of broadcasting, as to cable, and whether it has the ability to control all 100 channels of the new cable system, uh, as to the role of the telephone company in information. And on all these issues, so important to this nation, 
there is strong industry participation. The industries are involved, are militant, and are putting great deal of pressure upon the legislation, legislators and upon Congress. The public is largely uninformed and indifferent, and that doesn't bode well for decisions that will always serve the public interest. Television has grown to be a major player in our lives. It has brought us together in times of national triumph and tragedy. And yet at the same time, it has driven us apart, even in our own homes. Of its role in the future, only one thing is certain. It will be than ever before, and it will have the power to both enhance and diminish the quality of our lives. You're watching Sleep Core. Sleep tight. In a restless search for new opportunities and new ways of living, the mystery and the promise of distant horizons always have called men forward. First wondering, then searching, then continuing to explore, men have moved on and on always to find that old horizons open the way to new horizons. In a search that has continued for centuries, some far distant view with its promise of the unseen and its promise of the unknown has forever fathered the impulse to seek for new things in new places. New horizons, roads for men to go places. The accelerating rate of men's progress in all fields of endeavor has paralleled closely our progress in the freedom of movement from place to place. New things to do and new ways to do them. Telephone, electric lights, automobiles, aircraft, all are symbols of better living new places to go, and new means of getting there.
with a growing appreciation of the wisdom of applying the road tax monies to the road building program for which they were designed, highway development is going on at a rapidly increasing pace. Created by the crossing of new horizons, new ways of living and new thinking have laid the foundation for most of what is good in life today, with the promise of more tomorrow. As distant families have become neighbors, and as people have constantly widened their viewpoints while multiplying the number of their contacts, more desires have developed to be satisfied. And with the demand for all of these conveniences and improvements, opportunities for employment of men, money and materials have increased. And thus the highways of social and commercial developments are widening without end or limit, except the imagination vision of men who do new things. Today, engineers are always leading us higher, widening the trails, while our men of science are broadening all our mental avenues with new activities, activities based on modern pioneering into new fields of research. Men exploring and pioneering for all to follow men endlessly seeking something new along the roads of civilization in the great unknown expanses of applied science and scientific research. All the new highways of research and exploration have brought to us more raw materials, new raw materials, new combinations of raw materials, new and greater productivity of the soil, making more plentiful an ever-widening range of goods. And as these goods come down from the farm, the mine and the mill, progress on all the highways of human activity leads us to more opportunities for employment. An ever-widening range of goods made ever more plentiful from east to west, from north to south. Our greatest strides in providing more things for more people have been made at a time when the influence of new geographical frontiers was about over. Mentally and physically, we are progressing toward new horizons. To help us get a glimpse into the future of this unfinished world of ours, there has been created for the New York World's Fair a thought-provoking exhibit of the developments ahead of us, the greater and better world of tomorrow that we in America are building today, a vivid tribute to the American scheme of living, whereby individual effort, the freedom to think, and the will to do have given birth to a generation of men who always want new fields for greater accomplishment and will always find new things for all others to enjoy. Come, let's travel into the future. What will we see? And now we have arrived in this wonder world of 1960, 
the World's Fair exhibit, modeled with such artistry and skill that we must continually remind ourselves the world we are now seeing is a vision, an artistic conception which may undergo many changes as it develops into the great realities of tomorrow. Sunshine, trees, hills and valleys, flowers and flowing streams. This world of tomorrow is a world of beauty. These eternal things wrought by God are lovely and unchanging. Twenty years have passed. With new agriculture and industry, with new forms of education and recreation, a new world is constantly opening before us at an ever-accelerating rate of progress. A greater world, a better world, a world which always will grow forward. Man has forged ahead. New and better things have sprung from his industry and his genius. Here is a modern farm. The farmer of 1960 works in greater security, for science and research have helped him to control many of the risks of agriculture. Hours of work have been shortened with almost universal electrification of rural areas. Fruit trees bear abundantly under individual glass housings. Orchards are protected against disease and insects. Science even influences pollination by artificial feeding. Does it seem strange, unbelievable? Remember, this is the world of 1960 and physics and chemistry have joined hands with the farmer in helpful friendship. Here are the farm roads of the community. They have been improved and made to flow into great motorways. This superb one direction highway with its seven lanes accommodating traffic at designated speeds of 50, 75 and 100 miles an hour is engineered for easy grades and for speed with safety. Cars from the farm roads and feeder lanes join the motorway traffic at the same speed as cars traveling in the lane they enter. Here is an aeration plant purifying the lake water and distributing it for hundreds of miles throughout the countryside. Here is a highway intersection, highway engineering at its most spectacular. Traffic may move safely and easily without loss of speed. By means of the ramped loops, cars may make right and left turns at rates of speed up to 50 miles per hour. Elevated and depressed are the turning off lanes. There is no interference from the straight ahead traffic in the higher speed lanes. The motorist of 1960 finds this intersection safe and efficient. The two directional traffic of the motorway, which merged at the intersection, separates again. The highway surface is automatically lighted by continuous tubing in the highway safety curbing, which evenly illuminates the road surface. What's this just ahead? An amusement park, 1960. Man's progress has brought more leisure for amusement and recreation, bringing them within easier reach of more people. Industrial communities have gone ahead by multiplying the conveniences and comforts of living. Hundreds of comfortable homes for workers. All people benefited by broadening their scope of living, gaining by advanced means of communication and new methods of work. Here is a thriving and prosperous steel town. Notice the furnaces glowing, 
river, and rolling mills. In the foreground is a model airport, an efficient combination of motor, air, and rail transportation in the world of tomorrow. And now we see an enlarged section of 1960s express motorway. Along the ledge of this beautiful precipice, traffic moves at unreduced rates of speed. Safe distance between cars is maintained by automatic radio control. Curved sides assist the driver in keeping his car within the proper lane under all circumstances. The keynote of this motorway, safety. Safety with increased speed. This 1960 drama of transportation progress is but a symbol of future progress in every activity made possible by constant striving toward new and better horizons. Now we see ahead a steep, challenging mountain climb. Here we see a quiet and peaceful religious retreat, seemingly growing from the rocks as it looks out over the lake and foothills. The slower lanes of the motorway wind in and about the foothills. But from this point on, tunnel and cling to the precipitous rock faces. One marvels at its complete accord with the breathtaking scenic beauty of its route. In the valley ahead, a picturesque resort town. Farther on is a canal with a series of flood control locks. And just beyond, a giant mountain lake dam with its spillway, companion buildings and hydroelectric power plants providing power and light for hundreds of miles around. The motorway continues through the mountains. Without tedious travel, the advantages of living in a small town are within easy reach, bringing the people who live there into closer relations with all the world around. Over space, man has begun to win victory. Space living, space for working, space for pay, all available for more people than ever before. Over a spectacular suspension bridge, the motorway enters a large city, spanning the navigable river on which it is situated and forming a gateway to the city. A feature of this bridge is the elimination of congestion and the elimination of interference from all the various converging motorways and from all the feeder roads. And now we see a great river city of 1960. Twenty years ago, the population of this city was approximately a million persons. It is much larger, rebuilt and repanned. Residential, commercial and industrial areas all have been separated for greater efficiency and greater convenience. A vast circular airport is close to the city with a giant dirigible hangar so that it can be turned easily to meet any wind direction it is resting in a pool of liquid. Outside is an airport with its hangars and planes. There are special facilities for handling sea of the inland airports of 1960. Here is an American city replanned around a highly developed modern traffic system. The parks of the city have continuity, proper placement. These areas are united into long green strips surrounding each community. A 
along both banks of the river, beautifully landscaped parks replace the outworn areas of an older day. An industrial docking basin, newly completed, takes care of all the shipping from the adjacent industrial area. On all express city thoroughfares, the rights of way have been so rooted as to displace outmoded business sections and undesirable slum areas whenever possible. Man continually strives to replace the old with the new. A quarter of a mile high skyscrapers tower with convenient rest and recreational facilities for all. On many of the buildings are landing decks for helicopters and auto gyros. Rich in sunshine is the city of 1960. Fresh air, fine green parkways, recreational and civic centers. Modern and efficient city planning, breathtaking architecture, each city block a complete unit in itself. Here is an important intersection in the great metropolis of 1960. Elevated sidewalks give a new measure of safety and convenience to pedestrians. They actually double the available width for traffic in the street. And so, we see some suggestion of the things to come. A world which far from being finished is hardly yet begun. A world with a future in which all of us are tremendously interested. Because that is where we are going to spend the rest of our lives. In a future which can be whatever we propose to make it. Each of us may have different ideas as to what that future will be. But every forward outlook reminds us that all the highways of all research and all communication, all the activities of science, lead us onward to better methods of doing things, with new opportunities for employment and better ways of living as we go on determined to unfold the constantly greater possibilities of the world of tomorrow, as we move more and more rapidly forward, penetrating new horizons in the spirit of individual enterprise, in the great American way. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. Solar energy. The unlimited energy of the sun. The problem is the sun isn't always shining. We always have day and night. The sun is obscured by clouds and we can't predict when. Thus, we would like to be able to go someplace where the sun shines nearly 24 hours a day. And that place is in an orbit around the Earth. And that is a satellite solar power station concept that we've been pursuing for the past five years. 
Now, if we put out a satellite in space, 22,300 miles away, we can arrange solar collectors to convert sunlight and then produce electricity. Here, we have 24 hours of sunshine and thus we no longer need the energy storage which we would have to have with any device using solar energy on the earth because sunlight there is continuous. The beam that we form we can control very accurately so that we can hit any of the desired places where power is required on the face of the earth. We are a long way from having solved the problems we need to solve to make solar energy practical on a large scale. The solution most scientists are counting on is nuclear fusion. This is our MIT controlled nuclear fusion toy, if you like. The nuclear reactors we use now release their energy by fission. The atoms come apart. Fusion generates energy from the atoms coming together. Nuclear fusion would be safe. It would be clean. There would be no waste problem. And we have an almost infinite amount of the element deuterium, which comes from seawater, that we would use for nuclear fusion. Estimates are that to prove whether si controlled nuclear fusion is scientifically feasible would require an experiment perhaps 10 times as large as this. So this is what you might say, toy. But what a toy. It will be something like 1980 before people can tell scientifically whether it can come about. And that finally the question. Are we going to be able to make this fusion reactor work sometime in the future? Or will we find it's just not possible. On how that question is answered will probably depend the kind of world our children and their children and their children live in. We have been with this energy crisis for three hours. We've left out a lot. Three hours has not been enough to say all there is to say about it. We have not solved it. It is a crisis precisely because it's not easy to solve. In this country, we have used energy as if it would last forever. We have desecrated our environment. And now we've come to a time when we can no longer afford to do either. We've come to a time when we're going to have to decide by the choices we make in the marketplace, at the polls, as citizens of this republic, the shape of our future. It is, quite simply, up to us. Forty years ago, commenting on the way we were using up our resources, Will Rogers said that when we want steam, we dig up some coal. When we want wood, we chop down a tree. When we want oil, we dig a hole in the ground. It's when we run out, Will Rogers said, that we'll find out how good we really are. Sometimes I wonder about the way the world will be Think about the way it was before Our energy's flowing But which way are we going? And what will we do if it all